And now, live from the studios of Freedoms Phoenix, Ernest Hancock. Welcome back to Declare Your Independence of me, Ernest Hancock, and our new best friend, John Gibbler. He's author of To Die in Mexico, Dispatches from Inside the Drug War. Now, here's someone that spent years researching this book and follow, you know, uh, you know, right before it, he had another book he followed up with this one, and the previous book is Mexico Unconquered, Chronicles of Power and Revolt. Now, this is, uh, this is who, who else? I mean, before we even get and tell you how great and wonderful you are, which of course you are, is where is this news coming from, from another direction? Is there any newspaper in Mexico? Are there other authors? Are there any uh, you know, news magazines? Is anybody else on television, anywhere, that exposing the kind of information that you're putting out here, and how come you're not dead? Uh, well, the first question, definitely there's some excellent Mexican reporters that are reporting on this all of Spanish, but there are local news weeklies like one called Rio Dulce in Culiacan, Sinaloa, um, El Diario in Ciudad Juarez has done really excellent reporting. The national news weekly called Proceso does consistently good reporting. And there's several reporters, um, individual reporters that I always follow, a woman named Marcela Turati, and a young uh, man named Diego Sorno are both excellent, excellent reporters and going to the heart of both the human side of all these stories as well as the political manipulation involved in uh, the drug war. Diego has a great book in Spanish called um, El Cartel de Sinaloa, The Political Use of the Drug Wars, the, the subtitle. And then Marcela's book is called Crossfire. It's really excellent about looking into all of the intense devastating social impacts of the violence. So in Mexico, there's excellent work being done. Are their lives threatened? Absolutely. I mean, the, the lives of the local beat reporters, the local beat reporters are the people who really um, work under, I think, the most serious threat and, and conditions. I interviewed a man named Javier Valdez one time. I asked him whether or not he'd ever been threatened with death, and he looked at me and said, look, it's not necessary that somebody shows up at your office with a knife you know, to threaten you. Living here is a threat. Living and reporting on this every day is already a threat. And, and it's true. I mean, he says, you know, you're, when you write an article, you're thinking about the capo or the mafia dude or the corrupt local police commander who's not going to like it and drives around with a convoy of five vehicles can show up at your house in the morning. You have know? any journalists been killed over this? More journalists have been killed in Mexico in the past four years than any other country on the planet. Um, in the past two years alone, more than 30 journalists have been killed. All those cases remain in utter impunity. Okay. <sighs> All right. This is serious, and it affects us here in America also. And it's, and it's what we have to look forward to. But it's not just because it's this one single issue. It's not because of drug prohibition. Drug prohibition is a symptom of a much larger we wish to control your social and economic behavior. I mean, if we want to look at the same kind of we run everything, we just look at our economy. You know, or there we went. Mexico already had that problem a long time ago. So now we're looking at, all right, if we want to avoid this path, we need to look at certain things. And, and th this gun issue, we've been covering this a lot on Freedom's Phoenix. Every now and then we'll get a story up, and it goes like this. Yeah, all those assault weapons that they keep talking about that were going down to Mexico for the bad guys. Well, it was a BATF um, staying operation. They made the retailers sell them to them so they could track them and kind of blame it on and do. So what they're finding out, there's no shortage of guns down there anyway. They just wanted to link the United States ability to have semi-automatic battle rifles with what's going on in Mexico and take political advantage of it. So tell me, how strict are the gun laws in Mexico? Mexico has incredibly strict gun laws. Um, you can't, I think, you can't own any kind of a firearm without permission from the Army, from the Secretary of Defense. Huh. And even there, most people are only able to get access to low-caliber hunting rifles like 22s for you know hunting rabbits, maybe a shotgun. Um, and then there are, you, there are abilities, for example, for private security firms to get access to other kinds of weapons, but all those permits, again, come through the Army. Um, so it's very strict prohibition 
Uh, is there any shortage of firearms? No shortage whatsoever. No, I mean, there's a, a thriving black market. There's a there's shortage of firearms for the good guys that don't want to go to jail, that don't have a police buddy that aren't on somebody's payroll, the you know, rank-and-file individuals walking down the street. They are not allowed to defend themselves, okay? So now I'm asking, you know, what do you think should happen? You know, is it, do you think you're going to be able to, well, you already got the laws. I mean, how are you going to round up all these guns? You know, uh, the the idea of allowing people to be armed to defend themselves, does that go against your, I don't know, your philosophy? You don't see it as a solution? Uh, what do you think? Well, two things real quick. Personally, I might be a weird lefty. I'm a total lefty, but a weird one in the sense that um, I don't believe in gun prohibition. Personally, I grew up in Texas in the countryside, and I grew up around guns and was taught gun safety by my father and, you know, me and my brother are kind of like that. We grew up hunting. But I don't think it here simply changing gun laws in Mexico would really produce any kind of significant change because the nature of power is such that the laws on the books don't even matter anyway. Um, as is evidence now, you've got these strict gun laws and they're systematically violated. Um, I think the way the drug war is manipulated by the state and exercises you've said of social control that's the heart of the issue yeah see um, but you, the, the gun thing i mean at least it gives you a a fighting chance it allows you to fight it gives you it, the ability again, it, it, but it kind of doesn't because the people like just if we jumped into the way it is right now the people working for the cartels most of them came out of the police forces and military forces they don't know, only have access to guns but they come out of a training experience these are highly capable killers, sadly. I mean, they're very well-trained professional killers. I want the 28-year-old well. mother of three to be a capable killer in defense of her family and her children. To deny her that is you're just as bad as the bad guys. I agree in terms of that. I don't want to deny anybody training or capability to defend themselves. I also want to think about how do we structure a society such that this level of violence just doesn't take place. It just doesn't become an issue. No, no, no. I'm with you, brother. I mean, you know, I'm just, I'm not saying, you know, you give everybody guns, going to fix it. That's not going to do it. You know, right. what, you know what, what happens is it's just part of a much larger freedom philosophy that the whole purpose of government is the defense of the individual's right to, you know, keep breathing in and out. I mean, if, if, if you're not there to promote my breathing in, and out without interference from anybody, and certainly the government, well, then you're a bad guy. I mean, you know, what the hell good are you? Why are you here? You know, you know, we're from the government. We're here to help. Yeah, well, you find the masked gunman standing on every corner in their little convoy with their mask on. So I'm going, I'm not sure that anybody in Mexico with this kind of occupation is feeling a lot better. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a base philosophy. It can't just be drug prohibition. That is a symptom of a much larger problem. And the problem is people that believe that they can orchestrate your social and economic life in every respect. And then when you don't comply, you have to die. And that's what's happening. So I'm going, all right, Calderon is there. I remember when he first came in and the big, you know, he's, ooh, he knew some libertarians and former roommates of and guys and kind of sort of knew how to spell libertarian. And the thing is, they were expecting he was going to be much more freedom oriented. Well, maybe economically, he you know kind of waved his hand on a little bit, but uh, really, it's just more been the same. So I'm going. Why did he embrace this drug war so much? And since it's become an obvious failure, why does he continue it? And what is the mood and the the opinion of the people? What do they want him to do? He. He entered office, we should recall, with the weakest mandate, the weakest sense of legitimacy of any president in the 20th century in Mexico. He sent the army into the streets in his first weeks in office um, as uh, both, I mean, I think it was more as a gesture of a show of strength. He wanted to show himself as being a strong He's strong! President. When we come exactly. back, we'll let, we'll let uh, John finish his thought on this, because I'm very interested. What do the people want the president of Mexico to do? We'll find out when we come back.